Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. It is great to be back. After a few weeks, we ended on December 23rd, and we are back now. This Happy New Year is a Happy New Year to you all of our listeners, and a blessed epiphany season that started yesterday on this Friday, January the 7th. We gather this next hour in this epiphany light around the inspired and true word of God and look at Christ, our light and our life. This light shines on us today from the last part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 7. Jesus has some vital words concerning the false prophets, bearing fruit, pointing us to faith, and building our house on the rock of hearing his word and doing it. We've heard it many times, but what does it mean? We'll be blessed again to hear it, for the gifts are ready, ready for you. Today also is my one-year anniversary together with you around God's word. Thy Strong Word has been a Christ-centered Bible study here on KFUO since 2014, and also its predecessor, the Bible study, many, many years before. And what a joy it is to stand on the foundation of those who came before me, um, obviously standard on, standing on the foundations of Christ. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your patience and, and for joining us and digging deep into God's Word and keeping our eyes centered on Christ. So today I wanted to do something that I did a year ago on my first day, is I wanted to ask you, our listeners, to tell us, uh, give us an email today, kfuo at kfuo.org, or call in 314-821-0850 and tell us, where are you calling from? Last year, we did this, and we received many responses and heard from different parts of the world and around our country. For KFUO's motto is, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. And boy, do we know that you are anywhere out there um, that are hearing God's word. So send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, and tell us where you're listening from as we join together in God's word this morning. And what a joy it is today to start this new year with uh, the Reverend Dr. Nathan Metter, Executive Assistant to the District President of Mission and Mercy for the South Wisconsin District. Pastor Metter, happy Epiphany, happy New Year, and welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Happy New Year, happy Epiphany, and you got my <laughs> job title all in one breath. Usually people Ooh, have to gasp. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I, and I owe you, we must, <laughs> we must, uh, we must uh, start with an apology. I didn't oh. realize it was your anniversary or I would have sent you something <laughs> paper. Because I know that that's the first anniversary. I'm sure. I'm sure I've got an. I'm, I'm sure I can find something here in the in the dead tree world that I can uh, send to you in honor of your first completing your first year with yeah. thy strong words. So, well, I mean, I, I, oh, maybe I well. could send Kate. you a ticket stub. Maybe I could send you the ticket stub from last <laughs> Sunday night's football game because I know oh. you would love that. I'm not even sure if that game actually happened. I think there was one team out there, and the other team never showed up. I think that's kind of how well, that played that's out. That's what happens them. when you turn purple. That's right. That's right. So, But I, I'll tell you this. If you sent me a cake, that would suffice um, even better okay. than a piece of paper. So thank you for that. Even better. Anyways, All right. I'll see what we can do. So, so tell me, what's going on for you, your family, and the mission work in South Wisconsin? Uh, well, uh, the family, we uh, had the, the blessed opportunity to have everybody home for the first time in a long time. Uh, my oldest is a, a teaches uh, and directs bands and choirs at uh, um, uh, Concordia Prep in Baltimore. Uh, my daughter in the mid-January mid graduated with her uh, undergrad degree um, in exercise physiology from Concordia, Wisconsin. She's going to be starting uh, physical therapy school uh, in, in May. And then my rebel youngest son uh, finally came home from St. Louis University. Uh, he still thinks he's going to go into political science, but I know he's going to the seminary. Um, but it was nice to have everybody <laughs> home and, and in theory, keep everybody healthy, uh, you know, with, the, uh, with everything going on. Um, mission, uh, it, it's, it, was, uh, it was weird for me. This is, you know, while this is your first anniversary of a year on Thy strong word. This was my first Christmas not in the pulpit for 25 years, and that mm. was weird. That was weird. Um, uh, but that being said, uh, we're back at it, and uh, uh, we've got some some really neat things going. One of the things that we're, we're going to be launching here 
um, in the city of Milwaukee, we are working on um, a, a Lenten uh, devotional and sermon series uh, called 40 Days of Prayer for the City, uh, based on uh, Jeremiah 29, uh, the, the, the letter that Jeremiah sends to uh, the, the exiles and telling them basically to you know, get married, buy land, build houses, have babies, live your life. And then uh, verse seven, it says, and seek the welfare of the city for in it, you will find your welfare. Well, a couple of things in there, that word welfare uh, in English standard version is actually the Hebrew word shalom, which is peace. Um, and as we sit in a city that is uh, dealing with all kinds of rampant uh, issues of violence and I mean, but 10 blocks from here, uh, we had a young 16 year old girl who was, uh, who was shot while she was working at Burger King the other night. And, uh, mm. just to see the level of hopelessness in the city. Uh, and, uh, we have the 15 churches of the city of Milwaukee, the ones that are actually in the city limits are working together to make this, uh, this effort uh, come off and uh, we're going to put together a devotional and some sermon series and we're going to do some, use it as a, as an outreach tool as well um, in the city. So uh, we're, uh, we're, we're getting to work on that. Well, and that's a wonderful thing for us to <clears throat> focus on for Lent, but also in prayer as we come together today. So pastor, can you begin our time in prayer and obviously pray for the family of that young person uh, with the tragedy Absolutely. that just happened? What? Go ahead. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, on this day when your mercies are new, when we are still basking in the, the light of Epiphany, where uh, you have made yourself known fully to us in human flesh, uh, we rejoice at this. Uh, even in this day, as we prepare to study uh, some of your word, uh, as, as the Sermon on the Mount concludes, uh, we ask that you would dwell with us uh, and you would be that peace in the flesh. As you have made peace with the Father uh, and us, we pray too that you would make us instruments of your peace, that we would hear this word and put it into practice, uh, not, uh, not as people pleasers, but those who know and live out this word that you've entrusted to us. We pray that you would be with, uh, with us as we, as we discuss this word, those who teach it, those who hear it, those who engage with it, uh, that it might truly be a, a source of peace and hope, uh, a source of peace and hope that we so desperately need, not just uh, in, in, in Milwaukee, but in so many places, but especially in the family of this young woman, 16 years old, who was caught in the crossfire in a robbery at a Burger King. And as her family grieves, we pray that you would surround them with people that would speak the word of light and life in the face of hopelessness and death, realizing uh, that where your word is, there is light, and where there is light in the presence of darkness, the light always wins. So we pray that your light would win in us, in this family, and in our world, for the sake of Jesus, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Reminder to your listeners, if you have any questions concerning our text, give us a call, 314-821-0850, or send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org. And we have received one message saying they're listening from Melton, Wisconsin. Do you know where Melton, Wisconsin is, Pastor? Melton or Milton? Uh, it might be Milton. It says Melton, Milton. but I, I tried to look it up. Yeah. I say Milton. Where is that at? Well, uh, uh, Milton is South Wisconsin. It's down toward Janesville. Uh, I know uh, there, I think there could be a Melton as well. So, um, mm. th it's mm. beautiful, but it is. So you, uh, my guess is it's uh, a, a, a South Wisconsin, uh, individual listening from a South Wisconsin to the South Wisconsin mission guy. So actually I'm I love working. it. So I love it. Wonderful. So pastor, as we begin the end of Sermon on the Mount, I mean, what a, what a blessing it always is. And you always mm -hmm. learn something new. So as we begin, how do you want to start us off in the right place? Well, and that, that's just it. You know, as you sit here and, and you know, this is, you know, as, as I tell my, you know, my lame pastor joke, we know this is Jesus speaking as we look at our Lutheran study Bible because all the words are in red. Um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it's amazing the mastery of this. Um, you know, you sit here and you think our sermons are long. This is this is three full <laughs> chapters, man. Um, we started we started with those beautiful those beautiful words of the Beatitudes. 
Um, and, and yet what, what Jesus manages to do in the course of this, while he does say and do some, there, there's some, there's some pretty hard things in, in the course of this Sermon on the Mount. You know, we start with blessed are the, and, and, you know, and, and you get the, the poor in spirit. And, and those are the key words, because basically what we end up doing is we go from blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, um, and, and we, we get all the way around. And that's where we're that that's what, what G, where Jesus ends up at the end of this, you know, because it is that 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 confession of sin, repentance, and faith that has only worked when we are engaging the Word of God, and, and that's what Jesus has done with this this crowd, um, and, and you know, and that's the other thing too. We have to understand that we have a crowd here, and that's where that's where this chapter ends up, and and, and you have to you have to know who the players are. Okay, obviously Jesus is the preacher. Um, and then you have two distinct groups of people. You have the disciples, and then you have the crowd. Um, the disciples are not necessarily just the, you know, Peter, James, and John, and, and, and the rest of the guys. Um, these are those who have heard the word and follow. Um, Jesus will speak of them in, in in other places in the gospel. He will speak of them in turn in, in familial terms, um, and these are the, the these are his true family. Okay, um, and, and and then you also have the crowds, and in the crowd you have a group of people, um, and and there are, and and the crowds are these are people who are engaging with Jesus. They're hearing him teach, but. In this crowd, they have not yet they have not been led by the Holy Spirit to make that transition, or they're resisting the work of the Holy Spirit to make that step to not just be a hearer of the word, but also a doer. And, and so, so this is these these are the groups of people that we have, and and this is where this we kind of get to the money here in this section. Um, this is this is where the rubber hits the road. This is the so what in the life of the hearer. And, and and that's where we you know when we start building houses and, and things like that, and, and and but we hear Jesus teaching with an authority, so so there this is not at all disconnected from where we started in chapter five, this is not at all disconnected from those very poignant words in six which talk about you know uh, it's it's here in in chapter six that Jesus has some very stern words of warning you've heard it said you know you know don't uh, don't do not kill but i tell you that if you hate your brother you've committed murder or if you looked at a woman with lust in your heart it's as if you've committed adultery with her there's these hard sayings that are convicting and killing and yet they all end up back with that poor in spirit one led to repentance to cling to jesus so that, that's kind of where that's kind of where this is. We're coming full circle, mm -hmm. and and he is his conclusion is tying with his introduction. Um, so I'm sure that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know in, in the good old days, you know, Rev Ross, I would give him a pretty good grade for this sermon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would would Jesus pass homiletics one? Is the question. Um, is I, it, it depends okay. on which sermon structure he, he uses. So. <laughs> No, it's it, it's a perfect yeah. way for us to begin because really the whole book, as we've been analyzing, comes back to that. You know, um, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And right. today we see the fruit. What does it mean to be healthy? Um, what is the rock? Um, all of these things, and it really comes together with that link. The the words that you just mentioned, and of course, they're all Jesus's words. So I'm ready to begin. Are you ready? Let's go. All right. A reminder to our listeners, we'll be reading from the English Standard Version of Scripture, Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20 to begin. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So right away, it brings up many questions about false prophets. 
about, I guess you'd say, fruitfulness of, of who are these people? What is a good fruit? What's a bad fruit? And how will I recognize their fruits? So I'm, I'm kind of getting hungry for some fruit. So where do you want to start us with this? <laughs> well, it's, we, let's, let's pick a nice apple. Well, we, and, and here, I don't think, by the way, it's not an accident. You know, please do not immediately uh, that Jesus is talking about fruit from a tree to people who need to be led to repentance because mm -hmm. their first parents reached for the fruit of a tree for which they were not supposed to reach. Don't lose that image too quickly. Um, but, but he, so, so what we have is by, a, you know, and, and what we're going to end up having is Jesus by a tree overcoming. But before we get there, let, you know, so, so he, he, here's the first thing that we have. The reality is one would think that if, you know, if Jesus is who he says he is, by the way, I believe he is, um, and the disciples believe he is. But if Jesus is who he says he is, one would think that Jesus would simply speak and it would happen. Um, so if he comes and says, I, uh, the, the kingdom of God has come near, I am in the midst of you, that kind of stuff, uh, you would think that, hey, everybody's going to stand at attention and say, sir, yes, sir, may I have another? But the reality of what Jesus is saying is, um, we're going to have we're we're going to have this idea that um, there's going to be resistance, but th that should be nothing nothing new because we've seen resistance even in the Gospel of Matthew. You know the whole idea of the whole idea of of um, uh, of Epiphany. You know you had mm. uh, you have these wise men who show up, and yet you have Herod who plots to kill him. Um, or is it Satan trying to kill him using worldly authority? Hmm, there you go. Uh, but but what's what's interesting? What, and this is this is what struck me. And as I was as I was sitting in the pew last night listening to a sermon, um, been a while since I've listened to an Epiphany sermon too. Um, uh, mm -hmm. But but to, the words that struck me that that really stick out to me are the the last words of Matthew two. In the idea of and and they went and being warned in a dream, they went back by another way, um, and, and that other way that the that the the magi go back, that was not the safe way. They had they had likely come through the fertile crest and along where there was water. Well, to go back by another way means you're going to go back through the desert, which is not a good place. To, it, it's not it's not the usual route, not a good route. Um, so, 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 so they went back by another way. And, and I think there's something in this as we encounter uh, the, the, the Magi encounter Jesus and, 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 and they're, they're awed by his presence. They bring their gifts and, and, and they go back change. They go back by a, another way. And in much the same way, that's what's happening with us when, when, when we encounter Jesus too, um, if, if we are to be a disciple, a follower, we are going to go back by another way. Um, so, 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 and, and, and as we walk through this text, we're seeing that there's, there is only one other way that leads to life. And that's where we talk about the, you know, and, and we're going to get into that about the, the narrow, you know, we, we had that early in the, in the verses just prior to this, the narrow gate. You know, the, we're entering, the disciple enters through the narrow gate. Not all roads lead to Rome. Um, uh, not all roads lead to eternal life. Um, and, and, and along the road to eternal life, you're going to have these false teachers. Um, and, 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 and what talks about it's the hiddenness of the false teachers. Just as the kingdom of God is hidden under human flesh in the person of Jesus, under common elements of word and and later in the church uh, water and bread and wine uh, you also are going to have the appearance of false you're going to have the false teachers who look like they're true but they're actually fought flying under under a, a a false color and and as a result it becomes incumbent on us as god's people to test the spirits and you know that would to echo what we hear in in the epistles. And the idea behind this is that there's nothing new under the sun. Um, you know, this is where our, this is where our Eastern Orthodox friends, um, they, they very rarely teach church history behind the fifth century, 
or beyond the fifth century, because basically what they're saying is all the heresies that the church ever faced happened in the first five centuries. Everything else is just repristinization. You know, uh, if you if your family watches television or you stream Netflix or whatever, just the other day I saw an ad. They're remaking Texas Walker, uh, uh, Walker, Texas Ranger <laughs> without Chuck Norris, Lord you know, have mercy. because Lord have mercy. exactly, you know, or, <laughs> you know, or, uh, you know, I watched uh, for over Christmas. We went and we watched um, Steven Spielberg's remake of West Side Story. You know, so so basically what's happening is these false teachers, there, there's a core group of things. Uh, and, but, and, and, and while Jesus doesn't it, it, it list the different heresies, basically what we get is a, a taste of Solomon's wisdom that says there's nothing new under the sun. OK, mm-hmm. and, and so we're going to have this. So these false prophets, they have some mark. OK, they have the, these false prophets. They have marks. Okay, they're going to be appealing. They're going to be loving. They're going to, and, and in many cases, they're going to be a cult of personality. And, and we see this all the time. Um, whether it's, you know, um, I, I hate to, to go to the, the, uh, the, the traditional whipping boy for most of us, but an example of a false teacher in the modern world is, is Joel Osteen. You know, he's got the, he, he's got, uh, you know, he's wearing a suit that way, you know, that probably costs more than my car, um, you know, and he's got the perfectly coiffed hair and he's got the, the million dollar smile and, you know, and, 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 and yet when you actually listen to what he says, when you actually bite into the fruit, it is always devoid of law and gospel. It's always devoid of sin, which needs a savior, which happens to be Jesus. Now, uh, he, he may reference Jesus, but it's never Jesus as a savior. And, and, and these are the these are the ideas. And, and, a, and a true disciple, a true disciple is willing and, and understands that they are called to put the teaching to the test. Um uh, you know, you can you can be driving. You know, in, in now, granted, we're looking outside and it's frigid here, and there's no fruit <laughs> outside uh, unless you like snow. Um, hmm. uh, you know, lemon flavored snow cones. Um, but where the dog was. Uh, but but the reality is, you know, in in many of the areas that I've served, you know, you'll be driving around and you'll see this perfectly beautiful tree. It'd be loaded with apples, right? Hmm. But they're deer apples. They're awful. Tart, bitter, they're, they're, they're ugh. you know, they look like an apple, but they're not something you're going to want to bake a pie with. Okay. Um, and in many cases, too, you know, you're wandering through the woods and all of a sudden there's a berry. Oh, that, that looks like a bright, shiny berry. Yeah. And it's poisonous. It'll kill you. All right. So, so it, it's incumbent on us to know that we don't just, we don't do what Eve did in the garden. Because remember what she did, she looked. You know, she looked at, she, she was looking at the fruit. She was looking at at the benefits of the fruit. And what she dismissed was the truth of God's word. He said, Mm. don't eat of it. And she started thinking and, 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 and she, she was deceived by the, the deceiver and she took and she ate. And and this is what is, this is what's incumbent on us as, as, as people in in the world today, God is calling us to put, to put the the fruit to the test. And and some of that is when you walk through, you understand, you know, you know, there's certain, certain parts of the golf course that I play that when you hit a ball in the woods, you don't go there because that area of that area of the woods is full of leaves of three. You leave them be unless you want to scratch for, you know, so, so you understand. So, so you need to learn a little basic, you know, if you're wandering through the woods and you're hungry, you need to know a little basic botany. Is that pretty fruit going to be good for me or is it going to kill me? And that's what happens with the false teachers. It looks good. It looks appealing, but when you eat of it, it's bitter and it could bring death. So that's important for us to understand. And as we look at this, the question really comes up, okay, so you have, and and that's a great reminder for us, breaking it all down and bringing it back to Genesis 3 is is outstanding. Never would have made that connection. I could have, but I never have. And to recognize them by their fruits, 
we think of fruit as, okay, so they do good works. They do this, they do that. So then you're kind of like, well, wait a second. You're, you're saying that the, the, the false prophets and false prophets can do good works and all this. And so the question is, how can you tell if a false prophet is bearing bad fruit? Because it says you can recognize them by their fruit. Are we talking mm -hmm. that they serve more at, a, at a, a soup kitchen? Are you talking that they have more children or they look better like Joel scene? I don't know. How would you determine if someone is well, bearing bad fruit? Well, and, and it is the disciple is the one who holds to the truth. You know, and, and, and what is the one of the last admonitions that he gives in the Gospel of Matthew? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to you know, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Okay, so they're baptized into Christ, but teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. This is the whole word and counsel of God, which is exactly the opposite of what Eve did. They had the whole counsel of God. You can have the whole world. You just can't eat of that tree. That should have been enough, but it wasn't. Okay, for you and for me, we have the whole counsel of God, which points back to Jesus as the second Adam, the one who has the one who has done it for us, you know, and, and, and that's some of the appeal to the false prophets. You're right. The false, there are a lot of false prophets who do a lot of really nice looking things. You know, they'll be the first one to show up with a truckload of water at a tornado recovery or, or, um, uh, you know, they, they wear the veneer, but when you actually listen to what they say and you measure it next to the word of God, it, 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 it comes lacking. So, so that's important for us. That's why the disciple is the one who follows the voice of the teacher, not to cross over into John's gospel. Uh, but the reality is the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. And that's one of the reasons why it's important that you don't go, uh, that, that you have a home congregation, a spot where you are regularly hearing the voice of that under shepherd that Jesus has put over you so that, so that you're not, and you're not there because he's a snappy dresser or he likes the Packers or, or, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. he, he is, you know, you, you sit at his feet on a regular basis to hear the word and the truth of Jesus. And, and that's why it's critical, um, you know, and, and so I'm just going to say this flat out because I know we have listeners. You may not like your pastor. He may be boring. Um, he may be a Viking fan. God forbid he's a bear fan, whatever, you know, but, <laughs> um, but, but the reality is that's not a reason to leave your church. There is only one reason to leave your church, and that's if your shepherd is no longer feeding you on the truth of God's word. That's the only reason to leave a congregation, because that's the, because that's what happens. Because what if you start if you start if you switch because if if you if you go seeking another shepherd because that shepherd has a musician that plays a, a guitar rather than an organ, um, or sings. Uh, sings a contemporary song rather than an ancient hymn, that's not a reason to leave. The only reason to leave a church is if you are being fed false doctrine. And, and, and that's important. So you need to know your word. And, and, and if, you know, and if you've switched congregations because of that, maybe it's time for you to repent and go back home. Um, because that's the whole mess. That's the whole essence of, of the Sermon on the Mount, repentance and new life, going, going back the new way. And, and that's important for you to understand that. Um, and, you know, so, so if, if you're going, if, you, you know, if you don't pick a church because, you know, the two most important thing, the two most important decisions you make in your life. And I've taught this for 25 years in confirmation class. And I do this in Bible class all the time. The two most important decisions that you will make in your life that will affect your life in this world and your eternity, the person you marry and the congregation you join. Both of them will affect your present and your eternity. Um, they will either draw you closer to Jesus or pull you away. And, and, and the measuring stick is the word of God. Um, and, and so therefore it's, it's important. Um, uh, 
because ultimately false prophets will teach different about Jesus. They will give you a different Jesus than the Jesus that you find in the pages of Holy Scripture. And this is something I want to talk a little bit after our break is just this understanding, like you said so well, that we that the fruit we see is based on the preaching of Jesus. Is it correct? Is it not? And that's a challenge to you, our listeners, and to us as pastors, one, for pastors to preach faithfully, for our listeners, for you and uh, pastors or people to, to listen faithfully and to keep our feet to the fire to make sure we're not being false prophets, that we are preaching the truth of Christ. But right now we need to take our break. We are studying Matthew 7 with Pastor Nathan Metter, and we'll be right back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back. We are studying Matthew chapter 7 with Pastor Nathan Metter. And to you, our listeners, once again, we love hearing from you with questions and thoughts you may have according to our text. But also today, I want to hear where you're listening from. We've heard from one person from Milton, uh, Wisconsin. So send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, and specifically tell us where you're hearing from and how long you've been a listener. We did this last year. We heard from over 30 states over, I think it was two weeks, four different countries. And throughout the year, we definitely got over 40 different states. And I think I think it was only four countries that we heard from last year. But let's do it again. Even if you wrote in last year, write in again or even call us with a, with a, with a good word for us this morning. We love to hear from you as we gather together around the word of Christ. So, Pastor, today I want to do this. I think the next few verses really hits home with exactly what we've been talking about. So I'm going to read verses 21 to 23, and then to come back to this understanding of, okay, so what does this mean for our listeners and for us as pastors that, okay, we want to make sure that we are, I guess, bearing good fruit, that we're a healthy tree that bears good fruit. And what does this mean for us? So I'm going to read 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So, Pastor, there's a certain amount of hearing this where you're kind of kind of terrifying. First of all, you're telling me I have to really pay attention to what my pastor is preaching first. <laughs> and second mm-hmm. of all, um, wait, is what's going to happen to me on that last day? Am I going to say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to be like, uh, no, thanks. How would you just, how would you talk to someone who has those kind of questions? Well, and again, this is the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet. A false prophet will, will lead you to what you do bear fruit. Um, you know, uh, th- this is, you know, it goes back to, it goes back to the, the, the reality of why does an apple tree make apples? It's not because it decided to make apples. It's what God made it to be. Um, so, so it is an existence. It is, it is simply living out. So, so, so the, re- the, the tree does not decide if it's going to make apples. The, the tree is either going to make good fruit or bad fruit. And if it's bad fruit, it's going to get cut down and thrown into the fire as we hear, uh, as we hear. But we also have discomfort. Uh, Paul tells us, you know, second Corinthians says, no one says Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So remember, we're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus doesn't start with this. He has started with blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, the meek, you know, uh, the, the, he, he starts with those who have been cut to the heart by God's very word. And then 
through the course of the sermon, he's done some more digging and he's rooted out not just the surface level sins, but the fact that it's down in my heart. You know, uh, a, a, a false prophet will tell you, follow your heart, do what feels right. And, and then, you know, and just remember this, you know, when, when you hear a false prophet telling you to follow your heart, remember what the Bible says about your heart. Um, the, the, you know, in Genesis, it says uh, the heart of man is only evil continually. Jesus says, out of the heart comes sexual immorality, you know, that all this other, you know, so I really, I don't know about you, but I don't want to follow that. Okay. So, so, so that's the reality. Jesus, you do not have to decide, you know, you do not decide to follow Jesus. You do not decide to make good fruit. You are made to bear fruit. And the question then remains, are you going to get in the way of that process? Are you going to get in the way of that process? And, and, and the only way for the tree to bear good fruit is for it to have a sound root system. The tree is throwing itself, it, it's, it's anchored in the ground. It's not going to go anywhere, but, but through the roots, it's where it draws up all of the, you know, I paid attention a little bit of uh, in, in botany class, the, the xylem and the phloem, all that good stuff that works up through the tree comes from the ground, Okay. And, and so, so we are, when you are rooted in the true, uh, the truth of Christ's holy word, and you are regularly being nourished by it, the sun is hitting you, the water is coming, you're being fed and nourished through fertilizer and that kind of stuff, then you bear good fruit. Um, elsewhere, Jesus taught, you know, when, when he talks about the, uh, the, 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 tree that hasn't borne good fruit, you know, and, and the, and the, the, the gardener says, Hey, let me dig around it, put on some manure. And, but if it's still not bearing good fruit in a year, I'm going to, we'll cut it down. Okay. So, so it's important for us as disciples to stay rooted in the truth. If we're not rooted in the truth, if we're listening to these false teachers, we're going to start to rely on our own fruits. We're going to rely on our own efforts, which is going to make us not a disciple, but part of the crowd. You know, so if we don't want to be left out, it is to cling to that Jesus that is being. And that's why you test the spirits that are being pre pro You make sure that the preacher you're listening to is giving you the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of the culture. And we have far too much of that, um, you know, and, and because Jesus says hard things. And if your Jesus that you're hearing week in and week out never says hard things to you, you have, you need to start doing some examination. So let's get, let's get down to the, the bare basics here. For the a listener in the in the pews or a listener to our mm -hmm. program, and you're at a church and you're you're a Christian, even as pastors, the question is, how do I determine um, the the bad fruit or the false prophecies? Do you have a, I don't want to say there's like a, a a top ten list, but but kind of. Do you have some of those examples that would be very easy for our understanders to understand? Well, if they're, point, understand? if they're pointing you to what you do rather than what Christ has done. If they're talking to you about how easy it is to be a Christian, if they're talking to you about um, uh, about cleaning yourself up, if if you get a if you get a message preached to you that makes you want to be a Pharisee rather than a tax collector, see, because that that's the that see that's just it. You know, you look at the ones who respond. You know, and that's where you know, we get in this the last section of this text. You know, when when you you know who is it that listens? The people who should know better reject it. The people who don't, who who should who should just who who, who should be offended by this message, they're the ones that go back by the other way. The tax collectors and the prostitutes and those kind of things. Um, so so ultimately, you can't measure your preacher unless you know your word. And this is one of the reasons why you should, every Christian, every Christian needs to be in God's word daily. Um, you don't just, you know, you don't just water the, you know, you don't just water and feed uh, your plants one day a week. You know, we, especially, especially when we have all this other nonsense going on around us. Um, you know, you, you, it just goes back to health class. You are what you eat, what you consume. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, so again, you should be, God calls his people to regularly be consuming God's word through the ear, through the eye, and yes, at the table, through the mouth. Uh, this is the Lord's Supper. Um, you know, this, the, the more you're around Jesus, the closer you stay with Jesus, the more that these were, were the more that you will, you will have immediate affinity and comfort for truth. And the more you will go, wait a minute, that is malarkey. By the way, this is, this is the, the, you know, the false prophets of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and, and, and some of these others that tend to, to make really good headway. I mean, I literally, I got a, uh, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I, I, I got a phone call. Uh, the other day, because they, you know, they don't don't want to go door to door because of COVID. Um, so, so, and and they they use their entry point through moralism. They talked about the, the 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 horrible direction of our country. You know, wouldn't wouldn't you agree that we should be that our country is going the wrong direction? And, you know, and all of a sudden, okay, I'm awash in this because I have my own COVID fatigue and I have my fatigue with the political system. And I and and I found myself going, wait a second. And then 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 as I listened, can we call you back and share? Yep, yeah, okay. And then they gave me their website, jw.org, and I said, uh, no. <laughs> no, because I know what you teach and you teach a different Jesus. You do not teach that Jesus who is the second person of the Trinity who put on human flesh, who died and rose for my sake. You know, so, so this is, this is the kind of things. If you get moralism in the preaching that you're hearing, if you get, um, if you get a hyper man centered sanctification preaching, then, then you you need to start listening. So so get back and and stay connected to the truth of God's word, the rock on which our faith is built. And it's important that you understand it. The rock on which our faith is built. I am not the contractor. I am not the architect. I am not the 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 the, the, the guy running the the the, the skill saw. This is being done in me so that it can be done through me. I am a recipient of it, not a participant in it. So as you look at this, I, I feel like uh, there's many hymns. Built on the rock, the church shall stand mm -hmm. is one Even when one steeples example. are falling. Yeah. And, and, it, and it really is very clear, as you've, you, as you've said so well, that it really is as simple as... Are we being pointed like John the Baptist to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, or are we pointed back to ourselves alone? And this is important too for us to think about law gospel distinction, because clearly I don't think that you're saying, well, you shouldn't ever talk about ourselves and our need to repent. Uh, can you clarify that for us? How does this work? Oh. You, you kind of like point well, at no, Jesus, it, but what does this it, mean about us? How would you say that? Well, you're you're right. You know, and and this is the first thing: the the law must do its work. The you know the the if you follow the entire structure of the Sermon on the Mount, the law in the Sermon on the Mount kills, but it doesn't leave us dead. You know, and this is that this goes, this is ties back to this going back by the other way that we talked about way back at the beginning, you know, with the epiphany connection. Uh, the reality is we should be called to a new life, but not as a, not as a cause of salvation, but as a fruit of it, you know, and, and, and so as, as Jesus is doing his thing in us, it, it is going to have it is going to have results. You know, who is my, you know, you know, who Jesus does this, you know, he talks about this, you know, who are, who are the real disciples? They're the ones who hear the word and then put it into practice. You know, there, there, he hears the word and he puts it into practice in Matthew 21. There's a, there, there is a, uh, you know, you have the situation where you have the father who goes to his two sons and to the first son, he says, go into the field and work for me. And, and the first guy, the first kid says no, but then eventually turns around and goes back out and does what does the work of the father. The first one says, oh yeah, dad, I'll do it. And he never goes. And then Jesus asks the, the big, the $64,000 question, which one of these did the will of the father? And, and, and he, the one who went, he went because, the, because he, he, even though he was re, 
initially he rejected, the, the, the heart of the father convicted him and moved him to action. It wasn't a choice on the son's part. He, he, he responded to the father's question. The father initiated it. He didn't say, hmm, you know, the fields are ripe under the harvest and dad hasn't said anything. I think I'll go out and, and earn points with dad and bring in the sheaves. That's not, that's not what happened. It was in response to the father's teaching. The second son, he rejected it. He heard the clear teaching. He heard the clear, go into the field to work for me, and he rejected it. Nope. Yeah, he, he gave lip service, but he didn't put it into practice. And, and, and that's the whole thing. You know, when we're hearing the word of God on a regular basis, you see, that, that's the paradox of Christian maturity. You, one would think, you know, you know when, um, when, when, when one plays a sport, golf, for, like I'm a golfer, okay? I am better today than when I first started at the age of seven. Okay. I'm not all the way there yet because my handicap is still a 12. I want to, you know, I would love to be a scratch golfer. The only time I have a scratch golfer is when I go into poison ivy and I, and I itch. Um, but, but, but the reality is, you know, in, in, in the rest of life, the longer we do something, the better we get at it. It's not that way with the Christian faith. The longer, the deeper we're into the word of God, the more the law convicts us and shows us a need for a savior. You know, and the world may look at me, you know, the world may look at me and say, well, look at that guy. He's a mission guy. He helps, he helps replant churches and he's got it all together. And I don't, you know, I don't, I have, you know, I had an ample, I have a 55 minute commute to the office and I'm driving down interstate highways and I have ample time for my sanctification to be tested and I fail regularly. Okay. Um, and, and as I'm, and as, as it's really interesting as I'm driving, I'm listening to the word of God as I'm driving. Okay. And, and so my initial response to the semi who pulled out on a, on a semi snowy road this morning, when he, when there was no cars behind me, guys could have waited 30 more seconds and I'd have been passed and been no problem. I thought, and, and then yet I turned around, I'm listening to, uh, I'm, I'm listening to a section of Job and I'm like, oh, I hate when that God's word does that. It immediately convicts me. You know, um, and, and so, it, but what happens when we're convicted? Does the tree get cut down and thrown in the fire? No, we're driven back to Jesus. And we know that he's that one who meets us. He's that solid rock that continue, that, that is not shifting like we are. So let's move forward because this all builds off each other beautifully. What is the false mm -hmm. prophecy? How do we focus on Christ? And then we get to built on the rock, which obviously points to the hymn that I referenced. And I'm going to read the rest. We have about eight minutes left in our time here, Pastor. And I think it builds off each other beautifully. As you said, we all got we all got some work to do, so we better get back to the basics here. So verses 24, we'll go to the end. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So, so first of all, we, it's clear that people perked up when they heard these words, and how could you not? Secondly, I can't help but think about Salty, um, and was it the music mobile or whatever it was when I was a kid? <laughs> Don't build your house upon the sandy land. Don't build your house upon the shore. It might be kind of nice, but you have to build it twice, or you have to build your house once more. This was a song I learned as a kid, so that's right. what I'm thinking about. But Pastor, he has authority, and what are the words that really has that authority in these verses? Well, and, and this is different, okay? His authority, his authority is not, the, the scribes, you know, when you listen, you know, you go back and if you ever read the Talmud and things like that, what happens is generations of rabbis, they would not make assertions on their own. They would simply claim the authority of those rabbis who came before them, all right? Mm -hmm. Jesus was Jesus was making some pretty stern, uh, he was making some claims, not 
without merit, of course, because he is that rock. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is that narrow way that we've been talking about. See, and, th and that's just it. Um, when you listen to your preacher, you know, there, you, you can tell when, it, when, when he crosses over from authoritative to opinion because he can't say, thus says the Lord. Uh, when, when Pastor Finneran preaches uh, this weekend, when I fill in at Zion Menominee Falls, uh, when I preach, the only authority I have is the authority that is derived from the Good Shepherd. When I can say, this is what God says. And, and, and that goes back to some of what we talked about earlier. How do we know that, you know, how do we know that our preacher's right and, and the other and these false teachers are wrong? Because it points us back to the Jesus who is here for us. Uh, the one they're not speaking on their own accord. They're speak they're 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 ambassadors, they're delivering the message. They're saying, thus says the Lord. And Jesus is the Lord, so he gets to teach this way. But again, not everyone responded favorably you know so who are the master builders the mask the master builders are the tax collectors and the publicans the ones who encounter jesus who are cut and killed and raised and then who go back by another way and then they're the then the other side of it is the crowds often the religious leaders the ones who are steeped in the letter of the law but they reject the spirit and, and and you know so so this whole idea of doing it's it's not doing you know it, the one who hears the word he's in he he encounters Jesus directly physically uh, uh, verbally is laid low and then puts Jesus word into practice that's the one who is wise the fool is the one who hears Jesus and says that's nice and does whatever they want. And, 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 and great is the fall of the house. You know, and, and that's true of a congregation. It's true of a church body. It's true of the individual Christian. We will fall if we are not rooted on, if we are not, if our foundation is not laid on the rock of the one who established the church, Jesus himself. So, Pastor, as we look at all of this, there is a—I think there's a main thread that we see in these words. Like you said, the, the narrow road, and then it points us to, uh, 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 to following His Word, hearing His Word. And there's an emphasis that I've been reading in commentaries that throughout all of this is it starts with hearing, which leads to repentance and faith. That was one emphasis that I saw. Do you have a right. common thread that you've seen in these verses that we've seen today? Well, and, and that's, you know, that's what it is. You know, if you, if you want truth comes from being connected to and living in the one who is the truth. Falsehood comes from and is connected to anything else. And, uh, you know, it, it requires, this is an all in type thing. Uh, it, 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 it is a call to encounter, to hear, to, to honestly assess, to be moved by the Spirit, and then to live accordingly, not in the sense of earning it, but in response. And I think that's the, a, you're, you, th this whole thing, especially if you look at the, 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 the momentum, the, the movement in the Sermon on the Mount, is the call to repentance and new life. It starts out there and it ends up there. That is the, and, and frankly, if, if the preaching you're hearing doesn't move you like that, it's not, it's not sound. It's, it's, it's false. And, and that's what we should be listening for. Uh, we, we should be listening for the call to repentance and the work of the spirit in our lives, which leads, leads us in that repentance to a different kind of way um, that, that puts it out to, and, and realize that when we're outside of that way, um, we're not going to be part of the crowd. Um, we're going to be on a different kind of path. And it's going to, and, and, and that's when we end up with things like persecution. Um, when we start to say, no, um, you're, te you're teaching differently than our scribes. You know, that same thing happens today. You know, oh, you Christians, you teach different than our scribes, except our scribes are uh, broadcast media, print media, 
um, you know, social media, those are different. Those are scribes. Um, they're just parroting stuff. Ours is different. And, and, and we, and we, we can't be, you can't be a disciple and be part of the crowd. And that's the call that we have in Christ to, to be in the world, not of it. Pastor, we have a minute left in our time. How would you encourage our listeners this epiphany season is especially to bear good fruit, to hear good fruit, and also maybe to encourage their pastors to continue to be faithful prophets? What, what do you have? Well, what you do is, first of all, you got if you want to be close, you go be where Jesus promises to be. Is Jesus everywhere in the world? Yes, but he's not everywhere. He has not promised to be everywhere for you, word and sacrament ministry, um, and and frankly, and I don't, I don't, not virtually, get there, get to the presence, and encourage your pastor, and encourage your pastor. Ask the questions. Hey, what is what does God's word say about this? And and you know how how is this? And and and, and you know don't just say good sermon, pastor. Um, uh, you know, I, I always love that, you know, when I was the, when I was sharing the pulpit with an associate and somebody would come out and shake my hand and say, nice sermon, pastor. And my associate had preached that day. Um, it was, he's telling me that he was happy that I was silent. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, but the reality is engage with your preacher, engage the word of God with other believers, get into Bible study, get into the word on a regular basis you can't bear fruit as a tree unless you're rooted in Christ and, and you get where he promises to be and don't wrinkle up your nose when he ruffles your feathers and he says, Hey, um, that's not the way we do things. Um, measure and, and, and measure what he says, measure what you hear by the word of God, whether it's on the evening news or from the pulpit, but understand God's word is the final authority. If you don't like what God's word has said, don't get angry at your pastor. He's just delivering the goods. Realize that you, you know, he's the delivery guy. You need to take it up with management, and that's God. Um, so you, but if you want to bear good fruit, uh, the, the, the simple thing is to allow yourself to get out of the way of the work of the Holy Spirit and make yourself available where the Spirit works, where the word is proclaimed and the sacraments are administered according to their institution by Christ. The Reverend Dr. Nathan Metter, Executive Assistant to the District President of Mission and Mercy for the South Wisconsin District, giving us God's strong word from Matthew 7. Pastor Metter, thank you again for bringing us his gifts. Thanks, Brady. Good to be with you. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand. <laughs>